Okay, over to you, Richard. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, good afternoon, just. So we have best part of an hour um, to take you through, I guess, um, a little bit about this gamification trend that's hitting us at the moment for the last few years. Um, I mean, I've been you know, involved with game design for a number of years now, and what we're finding is a lot of people are struggling with the concept of gamification, and how to use it, um, because it is quite a complex beast, and there are lots of different opportunities to use it in workplace learning. So this session really was just um, to kind of break through some of the, um, the complexity of it, to give you some inroad into how to do it right, and give you some examples really of some of the work that we've been doing. Um, we've got the chat window open there, so please drop in any comments into there. I'll be asking you some questions as well. Um, we'd really appreciate your feedback because you know we don't have all the answers. Um, it'd be great to hear, particularly with some of the bottlenecks you're having with applying gamification where you are. We will give you a link to the presentation at the end as well. Um, so you can scribble notes if you want, but you'll be able to download it, but also access a recording as well. So what we're going to do is um, take you through four components really. We're going to look at the, uh, the Marmite scenario, you know, do we love it or hate it? Um, this is what we're finding. Some people are really into gamification, others a little bit wary of it. We're going to start there. Um, then we're going to look at some brain science. I mean, my role within Learning Pool is really to try and get under the hood of some of the trends that are in the industry at the moment to try and sort of make sure that we do it right, basically, that you know, it's, we're applying good learning design to whatever we, we are using. Um, following that, um, we're going to have some game inspiration. That's my word of the week. Um, some examples, really, of courses that we put together, but also some others that I found. Um, a small selection of really simple ones, but going up the scale in terms of complexity. And finally, some takeaways, hopefully some pragmatic things that you can go away and actually start using in your own organizations. So, let's get cracking. Marmite, I'm really not sure about Guinness flavored Marmite, that probably takes Marmite to a whole new level, but certainly I found it really useful when we talk about gamification, is really to start with, you know, how do we feel about it? Because I think a lot of people are feeling that it is for certain members of their audience, it's for younger people, and maybe not appropriate for all. I'd be really interested to get some immediate feedback from you attendees. If you could just type how you feel about gamification in the chat, um, love it or hate it, that would be, I think, a valuable bit of exercise for myself. So, like it, John likes it. Chris likes it. Yeah. Yes, I used to play computer games. I don't anymore. Um, love it done well. Yes, absolutely. So I think there's a general sense there of people feeling that it's appropriate, if not too patronizing. And I think that is the key. If it's done well. I mean, that is really what I was aiming to get out of this exercise. I was really hoping though, that someone would say they don't like gamification because this is my bit of irony. I wasn't gonna give them a badge, a non-game player's badge. Anyway, um, that's a positive start because I think if we do it wrong, we're gonna end up with something like this. Now, what am I showing on the screen here? What's going on? Does anyone remember this? Last year, I think it probably was. What are these guys doing? Type away. It's Pokemon. Pokemon Go. Absolutely. What happened to Pokemon Go? Well, someone made a lot of money and it's gone. Now, I think there's a temptation to think of gamification as the new panacea for learning. And I don't think really that is going to do it justice. Um, <coughs> my term for it is actually Pokemon Gone. Uh, because it's come and gone. And I really want to emphasize that, you know, myself and I think many people that I know in the industry uh, really want to avoid this scenario. 
You know, we need to make sure that whatever we do is fits into the workplace, into the workflow, and we intelligently use game mechanics to change behavior, uh, but not just kind of apply it like a blanket across everything that comes along. Um, it's worth reiterating that, I think. So, um, very strange image on the screen now, but um, I thought about gamification and my own attitude to it, and I thought about a typical Saturday for me, and it so happens that when I get up, I go for a run, and I upload my run to Strava, and Strava tells me that you know I'm maybe on a leaderboard, um, I'm, I've got a, a new segment I'm, I'm actually winning on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of my friends have done the same. Later on that day, um, I'll go for a coffee, and when I'm in the coffee shop, I'll present the uh, cashier with my little card. It gives me a free coffee if I get 12 stamps. Um, fantastic. Later that day, um, I go on TripAdvisor. Um, I browse for holidays, I look at recommendations, I look at ratings for different places that I can go to. Maybe I want to go to Barcelona, find a great hotel, um, because it's got high, high rating on, on that particular site. Then in the evening, I go on iPlayer, again, I look at ratings for different programs, different documentaries, maybe things that people have recommended for me. What's happening here? Well, my whole life is gamified. Um, and I think, you know, when we stand back and think about it, you know, life has become a gamified experience. I listened to a TED talk recently where this American innovator is wanting to apply a gamification layer to the world. Um, he sees gamification as almost being the entire experience that we have in life over the next few years. Quite a scary experience, but I think it's, it is happening. So whether we like it or not, gamification is here and we are part of it. Um, so I think that's worth stating is that it clearly works for marketeers. Um, maybe it can work for us as learning developers as well. Now, um, the other kind of pushback we sometimes have is that, well, gamification suits millennials, you know, they've grown up with games, but, you know, most of our population are senior people, experienced people, you know, they don't want the trivial, a trivial game to kind of learn something, they just want to, you know, get on the job and apply what they've learned in a very different way. Well, there's a lot of research that says otherwise. Um, this was a study done at the University of California where they took a group of 60 year olds and asked them to play a game for 12 hours a month. Now the results of that actually showed that their multitasking approved to the point and better than 20 year olds who were playing at the same time. Um, and there's a lot of evidence as well that gameplay can help people with dementia um, and other kind of disorders like that. So they have real benefits for everybody. Um, so I don't think this is a reason not to use gamification. Again, I think it goes back to how we do it, how we frame it, um, and, and deliver it to suit the particular audience. So the other thing which um, I think is interesting is if we look at different types of technology as well. Now this is a study done one by one of our colleagues in the industry, and they looked at the um, the immersion, um, the ability to multitask and the engagement of different types of technology. So what we've got here is watching television, browsing the internet, listening to music, social media, and gameplay across these three different parameters. Now, you probably guess where this is going, but it is quite interesting because I'll just expose the top ones to start with. A lot of this, a lot of this is obvious. I mean, listening to music, it's not particularly immersive, it's not particularly engaging, and it's very easy to multitask when playing music, when listening to music. Um, social media, similar but slightly less so, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when we get to gameplay, it is the most immersive, the hardest thing to multitask while doing it and the most engaging of all technologies on that list. So surely, I mean, in my eyes, there is something here that we can use. There are some mechanics involved in gameplay that are worth looking a little bit deeper at. Um, there's a really good example of this for one of our customers. Um, we do a lot of work with PwC, and we had a call to our help desk saying that one of the modules that we've been 
we delivered was actually um, problematic. The e-learning stream kept disappearing um, while it was um, being viewed by the learner. So we investigated, and what we found is that the learner actually had two screens going at the same time, two, two screens side by side. On one screen, they were watching a, um, YouTube videos. On the other screen, they were doing their e-learning. So every time the YouTube video changed, the e-learning stream disappeared. Um, they were multitasking, and you know, I don't think we, you know, I don't think we fully appreciate how much people multitask when they are learning at the same time. So it is an issue, and maybe something like gamification, or game design, can actually help with some of these things, help make the whole experience more immersive. So I think that's really useful. Um, okay, so let's get into the HUD a little bit. Let's think about you know the sort of the brain science behind game game design and gamification that we can really start to use. Okay, well, the first thing I think to, to distinguish, and you know, I think this is out there in the industry already, but you know, it probably does need reiterating, is there, a, there is a real difference between gamification and games. Now, on the screen here, we have got an example of gamification and a game. Now, which is which? Which is the gamification? The top or the bottom? If you want to type something in chat, the top. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? It's the old Costa Coffee card. It's the application of game mechanics to a non-game environment. I mean, this has been said many times now. I hope that's fairly clear. The game, for anyone who's over 30 and recognizes um, Pluto, I hope you do. <laughs> there are many examples. Um, a game is obviously much more immersive, it's got characters, it's got rules, um, it's got um, storytelling, it's, it's got the, the whole immersive experience. Um, and with things like Cluedo, it goes on for hours and hours in, in, when I play with my kids. Um, a very different experience, but there is a clear distinction there. Now most of the mechanics I'm about to talk about are more applied to game design, but a lot of that kind of knowledge can, can trickle down to gamification, which is more involved with points, badges, and leaderboards. It's almost like the icing on the cake, really, to tempt people in to learning content, which might be quite traditional. So hopefully that's clarified that for you. Okay, so I'm not a great fan of definitions, but I think sometimes it's quite useful for new areas like this which can be quite confusing and, and, and feel like a little bit where do I start? Um, this is a really quite a nice definition of a game. Um, I particularly like the words in capitals because I think they help us distinguish game design from learning design. We're talking about a game that is voluntary. A lot of learning is mandatory. That's a fairly distinct difference. A game is made up of attempts, whereas a learning experience might be a one-off thing. You know, a game we can play a game, we can try and improve on things, multiple sessions. Obstacles, you know, again, within a game we don't necessarily see learning objectives. We see things that we really hit up against, obstacles that we really have to defeat um, that are quite difficult and probably get more difficult over time. So I think that's quite nice as a starting point. The next thing is um, this example of a negotiation skills course. Well, maybe not, but a game provides a safe place to try new things. Um, think of a health and safety course where you want to mimic um, a fire or you know, issues within an environment that, that are highly risky to replicate in real life. Um, games are fantastic at these. Um, difficult conversations that quite maybe um, unethical to have in the workplace that you can actually create in this environment to let people fail safely that is a really great use of, of game design the other example of this is I don't know if anybody goes on YouTube um, or Facebook and sees those horrible quizzes that ask you you know what does your album collection say about you um, these things, people, really, we really like doing these things because they tell us things about ourselves that we don't know. Um, my album collection tells me I'm an old hippie. Um, but again, it's, it's providing a, a safe place to find out things about ourselves that protect, maybe we couldn't find out in any other way. Um, 
games provide that sort of environment to do all sort of interesting things in this sort of space. Um, I think this is probably the most significant slide because at the end of the day, it's how games actually impact the, the learner that really matters. Now on this page here, we've got a learner and what I've called a player, which I think is the distinction I'm trying to make. I think it's pretty obvious who is who. The player is the, the guy on the right who's clearly been up too many hours playing games. Think about the learner and think about the sort of experience that they have. A learner sees some objectives. Um, generally what they're doing is mandatory. Um, they read and watch things. They follow some instructions. They rarely fail. You know, how often do we actually make people fail in e-learning? We really want to get them to the end as fast as possible. And their kind of interaction and feedback is fairly sparse throughout a learning journey. The player has a very different experience. I'm going to sort of just let you read through that because I think this is really significant. Um, the player has a framework within which to play. They have rules. Quite often it's a voluntary experience. You know, the whole engagement about wanting to play the game is enough to actually get them in playing the game. Because it's an experience, again, you know, they're, they're, they're immersed a lot more than they would be in a traditional learning experience. They don't get many instructions. You know, it's very much a case of getting in and having a go, um, but improving over time. And this constant state of fear of failure, this constant feedback and constant interaction that keeps that engagement. This, I think, is a good place to start if you're thinking about developing a game. It's about how can I actually create that and make someone feel more like a player and a learner. Okay, so a mechanic. Who have we got on the screen here? Does anyone remember snooker back in the 1970s? Good old Higgins. Alex Higgins, of course, um, fantastic individual. What was Alex famous for? Any comments on that? The hurricane, absolutely. Apart from the gin and tonic intake, which was quite phenomenal, it was the speed. It was the speed with which he actually moved around the table. I was obsessed with Pop Black back in the 70s, and Alex, who really made Snoop what it is today, he seemed to be in the zone. You know, he had this ability almost to zone out of anything that was going on around him um, and just play the game beautifully. Um, this is a state that we call flow. Now, flow has been defined as the state that athletes get into, that musicians get into, where they, they lose a sense of time, they lose a sense of, of eating, you know, they, they forget to eat. Um, in Alice's case, they don't forget to drink, unfortunately. But it's a state that's been described by a psychologist called Mihai Chitten Mihai. It's Hungarian, and that's why it's quite challenging to say. But this flow state is a very powerful mechanic that is used in game design a lot. Now, I've got an example here of um, flow in, in, in place. But what I'll show you first, actually, is, is this slide here, because what um, this chap actually defines is a flow state that aims to lift people out of this state of boredom and make them more anxious. Now think about learning design, you know, the, the learning design that we all do, where we are all guilty of maybe bumping learners across at this bottom axis in a perpetual state of near or not so near boredom, increasing their skill, yes, but certainly not, maybe not making the difficulty as, as hard as it could be. What he says is, if we can lift this bar, and make things a little bit more di um, difficult. We can make people feel a little bit more anxious, but get people into this flow state of what he calls an optimal experience. There is a lot of evidence to say that the more anxious we are, the better we learn. I can vouch for this because I remember when I had to create a report, a management report in Excel um, using a pivot table. I'd never used pivot tables before. I had five minutes in which to prepare this report. I went on YouTube, within three minutes, by God, I knew how to use pivot tables. I was anxious, I learned fast. It's a very powerful mechanic. Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide here, um, there's a really simple example of what I call 
flow possibly. Um, little note to self here is this, app, this is a very old storyline course that only works in Internet Explorer. So in true Blue Peter fashion, I've got it here. I think this actually demonstrates several other game mechanics as well. But literally, this is the opening screen. This is all I get. I, I don't know what to do. Um, what do I do? Well, there's a door. So if I select the door, the door's locked. How can I get it open? Well, all I can see are left and right arrows. If I click left, there's a picture. Okay, well, I don't know what to do with that. Go back to the door. Maybe I go right. Go right, there's a table. There's some strange sort of dots on the screen. Piece of paper, ah, oh, select the paper. I've locked the key in the safe. The key to the door, I presume. Okay, so key to the door is in the safe. Where are safes often hidden? Ah, oh, behind pictures. Oh, the picture moves. There is a safe. Um, there is a safe. Um, there seems to be some sort of a combination. The combination was wrong. Maybe it was, was wrote down. And question their English there. Maybe it was written down somewhere. Um, where was it written down? Well, there was a bit of paper. Um, it's, maybe this is the combination here. So it's a sort of a U shape. Aha. I'm learning. Go back to the safe. Put in the U shape. Open the safe. There's the key. I was in an anxious state. I didn't know what was happening there. Um, very, very simplistic example, but I think that's a really great example of something which hasn't given me much information, um, but it's put me in a slightly different mindset. So I quite like that as a starting point. Think about flow. The next one is a film. Name the film. In the chat, good old Groundhog, of course. What happens in Groundhog? Again, paste it. What happens in Groundhog? It repeats. The day repeats again and again and again with slight differences. Now, this is a mechanic which I've mentioned already. Games are multi session. There aren't many games out there that really the intention is to play once or you pause it and come back. You know, games tend to be short, sharp sessions. The whole premise of that being improvement over time. Again, a very powerful game mechanic. There are loads of examples of this out there. Um, I've got another example here of um, a website, which I'm gonna show you. Just an example, really, of how that works in reality playspent.org. Have a go at this if, you, if you've got a web browser open. Um, the idea here is that it's really showing me the kind of the reality of living in the United States with, um, with no job or with a, a very minimal income. Now, I'm not making any political reference here. Um, but the idea is you've got a budget. And there are sound effects on this, actually, but I'll turn those down. So you start with a budget on the top of the screen here, $1,000. And you've got a series of tasks that you're going to work through. So here, I need to choose a job. So I can select a, a warehouse job here. I get some feedback. OK, my weekly pay is going to be $306. That's great. My next task, though, is a um, healthcare plan. Now, there are various options here. Um, I want to go for gold because I really value my healthcare. Now watch what happens to my balance. It comes down. Um, find a place to live is the next challenge. Once I pay my rent, bang, my balance is coming down. Now this is multi-session, you know, because the idea is I get to the end of this, I basically lose all my money. But I have another go. You know, I see how I can balance the books by making different life choices. That is the whole reason for, for playing this game. It's a really short, sharp experience, but extremely powerful technique to use to, to kind of encourage people to have another go. So I really like that. Um, so hunt for the examples like this and think about how you can apply that kind of concept to 
um, some of the games that you, you, you're thinking of developing. Okay, the final game mechanic is another film. So name the film. Type in chat. Anyone remember this one? It was a cult film. Um, it was a bit of a flop at the time, but I think it's, um, it has got a bit of a cult following, probably because of the late great Bowie. Um, now what happens in Labyrinth? It, it is a very kind of exploratory experience. We don't really know what's going to happen next. Think of that in terms of game design. Um, big word of the day, progressive disclosure. This is a very powerful game mechanic and it's something I think probably the most significant one that you could think about. You know, we don't really know what's going to happen in the game. We get minimal information before we start. We do not get a list of learning objectives at the outset. You know, that is very, very important fact. Um, I've got a final example of this, which it demonstrates this perfectly, and there are loads of these examples. Uh, there's one here called the Global Rich List, which I'd encourage you to have a quick look at. Um, in this example, all I get on the screen is the ability to enter my annual income. Well, I don't really know why I'm doing this. I've got minimal information about what this is going to reveal. Well, times are hard, so that's my salary at the moment. Show my results. On the next screen, I see where I sit. I'm in the almost the top 12% worldwide. Well, that's very enticing. That's good to know. Feeling a little richer? Well, possibly. Keep scrolling. Meanwhile, though, in a factory in Ethiopia, um, someone makes 15 pence in the same time. I'm starting to feel a little bit bad about this, but I keep scrolling. Um, an hour of my salary can purify enough water to last a child for 17 days. I'm feeling even worse about this. Can you see what's happening here? I mean, drip fed information. Um, okay, an hour of my salary could pay for um, the mosquito net, etc., etc. I think you probably know where this is going. You know, it, it's pulling on my heartstrings, but in, in small, painful steps. We could have showed this on a single slide, but would it have been as impactful? I don't think so. We've broken it down into really short, sharp messages, and it's given me the opportunity to think very hard about my own decisions in life. Um, really powerful technique. Now, how many learning designers have we got on this webinar? Um, maybe a lot of you are using Storyline, possibly. I know, I know a few of you do out there. Now, one of the biggest challenges probably is looking at the authoring tool maybe that you're using at the moment and think about how you will approach the design of your first game possibly. You may well be familiar with the ADDI model of instruction design. It's very well established. Um, it comes from the classroom. Um, it's analysis, design, development, implementation, evaluation. Very solid, it works. Now when we started developing our first game, we quickly looked at that as a model of development and thought that it's not really going to work. It's not going to really provide the level of innovation that we needed to apply to game design. So I sat down and thought about a different way of identifying the key components of a game that we really need to think hard about to make the game work as a very different piece of learning, if you like. So, the first thing we thought about is every game needs a starting point. You know, we need that big start button to say, are you ready? Begin. Before they hit the start button though, we need to set a challenge. You know, these, these are not learning objective. This is a challenge. You know, you've got to defeat this individual. You've got um, to have three management meetings. Um, you've got to come away with, um, you know, solving these health and safety issues in your organization. Whatever that is, you give them a challenge. You also give them some rules. Um, now this could be very simple. It could be you have 10 minutes to undertake these three challenges and you've got a bank of 100 coins to spend at the same time. Bang. Once we have a challenge, once we have rules, we can start. Now then, I've called it a game engine. It doesn't have to be anything too complex, but we need something to control the experience because what 
we give access to at this point are a series of levels. So rather than again in the past, maybe these would just be individual interactions in a, in a module, levels potentially are incrementally more difficult. So level one might be something where we interact, but it's quite straightforward to do. But then the, the next one will get more difficult, more challenging, but maybe we get more points as a consequence. So we think about levels in t you know, differently from um, interactions. The other thing that we get constantly is feedback. You know, after everything that we do, we see our, our health, our status, our avatar quality, whatever it might be. You know, we have an, an immediate indication of how we are doing. This gives that anxiety. This makes people feel involved. Um, everything within the whole experience is on a dashboard. You know, we see our score on every single screen. We don't just see it at the end of the experience. You know, it gives that sense of involvement. It gives that sense that things are changing over time. A dashboard throughout. And this is the one I like the most. I found this somewhere that, on some um, blog post. Someone came up with the concept of an epic meaning. So at the end of the module, we just don't see well done. You know, this is what we might have seen in the past. We have a sense of achievement. You know, we've saved something. We've, um, we've gained a, a badge. We've, we've, we've won a prize. And there is something that really is going to make us finish this. If we fail the first time, it's going to make us want to come back in and try again. As a model, that, this has really worked for us. So I think it helps us think differently about learning design when we get down to the reality of building it in our favorite authoring tool. So, some examples. So I've picked a few here. Um, what The first one wasn't built by ourselves, it's just something I heard of, which I really like the concept of, very simple. Um, these are all built in Storyline. Um, now, you know, I'm not saying that you can go away and build these, but hopefully there is one thing within what I'm gonna show you that's gonna give you an idea that you could possibly go away and think about. Um, the first one is, is, is not an e-learning course at all, but I think it displays elements of a different mindset to delivering mandatory training, which I really liked. Um, this was someone at a session I went to who told a story of an organization who delivered mandatory data protection training, and the refresher training was not more of the same. It was an email. It was a, a random email from the IT department which mimicked a spoof phishing email. So this went out to everyone who'd taken the training maybe 12 months later. Now, if the individual actually selected that, it, the link in that email, email to link off to whatever it was trying to get you to do, it actually linked to refresher training. Well, he said, well, obviously, you know, you, you, didn't, you, you didn't actually heed the training advice. You clicked on the email. You need more refresher training. I think it's a fantastic use of a different mindset. They had a leaderboard as well of how many people have been caught out. So there were elements of gamification in this. But again, it was that idea of focusing on what is the core behavior within the refresher training that we, try to, that we are trying to stop. And in that situation, it really, really worked. I love that as a concept. The next one is a piece of work that we've done for PwC. Now, we do a lot of work for PwC, and they're quite a challenging organization to work with for several reasons. The brand is quite, quite, quite limiting in many ways, and highly professional audience. Now, we had this opportunity to create this course called Auditing Listed Companies. Now, if you develop dry mandatory content, I, I, I'm pretty confident this would um, be in that sort of arena. Um, extremely challenging content to treat imaginatively. Um, so they were quite interested in gamification, but the audience they had really weren't quite ready for the kind of rich game experience that you know, we've maybe done for other customers. Now, I'm going to just play the first couple of pages of this because we did something really, really simple that worked within that environment. So the, the course is going to open. We're, going, we're, not, we're actually going to skip this opening video 
um, because we don't need to hear Steve introducing the course. I've heard him many times. Great as you are, Steve. But the interesting part is the animation that follows. So hopefully you've got to hear this as it plays. PwC is auditing a listed company, Peacock PLC. Peacock PLC is the holding company for a number of major food brands. PwC has been the auditor of Peacock PLC for several years, but some members of the team, including you, are new to auditing listed companies. And it's your job to complete the audit. Luckily, Steve from Assurance Risk and Quality will be on hand to guide you through the process. Complete the topics in this e-learn to build on the skills you need to audit Peacock PLC. At the end of each topic, there's an activity that gives you the opportunity to win a PLC token. The more PLC tokens you collect, the fewer answer options you'll see in the final knowledge check at the end of the e-learn. So that you That's it. That is the hook we use in this particular module. And that was so appealing to this audience. As soon as we presented this to the, to the stakeholders we were working with in PwC, they said, yes. So the more attention people pay to the learning content, the little self-checks in the course, if they pass those, a question is taken off the final assessment. That is game design but it appeals to that type of audience. That's the sort of use of gamification or game design that I really like. Really subtle, but it absolutely fits that particular audience. That kind of, the, the, the engagement is, is really gonna get them. So that's that one. Um, the next one is, I guess, taking things up the scale a little bit. This was for Fujitsu. Now, again, uh, a challenging organization um, and commercial awareness for them was costing the business a huge amount of money. New IT consultants were coming into the business with great IT knowledge, but very little commercial awareness. Now these guys were involved in setting up contracts um, and service level agreements with major organizations. Now, if they missed a certain paragraph out of one of these contracts or um, didn't communicate something correctly by email, it cost the business millions of pounds. I mean, these contracts were huge. So Fujitsu came to us and said, how can we teach these guys commercial awareness in you know, an electronic form? We'd love to do it. Um, very interesting gamification. So that is really what we pushed back, put back to them. Now these were, were a set of very complex branching scenarios. And what we've included is this idea of health meter. Now the health meter gives them a sense of how healthy their decision making is. Now on the screen now is a, you wouldn't want me to do a live software demo anyway, so this is actually recording, but there is a link to the course uh, we can provide that you can have a play with. So the idea here is that you are gonna go through a series of decisions and you've got this health meter which starts out at neutral but it can fluctuate either way. So you can go down to minus five, you can go to plus five. But the idea is that if you make one bad decision, that's not it. You know, you aren't then, aren't then on a downward spiral. You've got the potential to actually claw that back as in real life. So it's built in storyline, but it's got a very sort of complex kind of um, network of decisions that can be made. I think there are 10 decisions that can be made in here. Now they are different types of um, interaction so we might watch a video we might listen to a voicemail message we might respond to an email it, you know the, the script for this did not exist it took probably two or three months to actually construct the complexity and, and the, the finesse to which these decisions decisions are made we've also got a notes tab so obviously complex information being given over to the learner the notes tab because gives them a bit of a refresh as to um, what information has been given out to them that, so they can um, inform themselves before making any, any decision. We give ourselves a name, so that allows us to actually put people's names on emails and on documents in a quite a realistic way as well. We then get to the point where we can begin. So the challenge has been set and my boss calls with a request. On the notes tab I can see a bit of background, city hotels, 
we've got a contract in place to install a, a, a WAN and a LAN. My first interaction then is to read an email. Now, this is a multiple choice. You know, yes, it's a, it, it's a game, but effectively every decision is a multiple choice. We've got an email and then we've got three potential responses. Now, this is actually a fairly easy one. Um, the correct response is quite probably the middle one, it's the longest. But these decisions do get harder and harder. So hard, actually, that um, the SME that we work with actually failed this several times. Um, the way Fujitsu have set this up, though, is two failures and you're out, basically. That then sends a, a notification to your line manager and he does sit you down and walk you through the process you went through to help kind of improve your commercial awareness. There's lots going on in there, but I think the health meter there is something that's worth thinking about. That's something which we've used several times. The final example I'll show you is this one that we've done for Santander. Um, call of data, um, you probably um, recognize the kind of the name there coming from another game, famous game. But um, Santander um, had this challenge with data within the organization. How do we use data? How do we use pivot tables? Young millennials coming to the organization with no real appreciation of what data was or how to use it. Now, because this was a non-critical piece of learning for the organization, they were quite happy for us to, um, to give us quite a, a, an open creative brief. So it was a great project to work on. Um, so what we built for this is um, a reusable game engine. So we've actually got this plugin now for Articulate Storyline that we've actually used for several different customers. Um, I'm going to give you a flavor of this one as well. Now, in this case, um, this game engine has got various components that we can turn on and off. So we've skinned this up for Boots, for AstraZeneca, um, for Tesco, and in this case, Santander. So there is an avatar selection option that we, should, we can use to give people a face and a name. That face and the name can go onto a certificate. We've got a series, we've got a series of activities. Um, we roll a dice and we move around a board. And it's a fairly random experience. So when we roll a dice, it is truly random. Um, there are 10 activities that we link off to. We can take those activities several times. The really interesting part here, which I'd like you to think about though, is we've got a gambling mechanism in place here. So we've got a, a bank of 100 coins, but we can choose when to spend those. So if we are particularly confident in one of these activities, we can say, I'm gonna gamble my, all my coins on that activity because if I, if I pass it, I'm going to get double back. Now, the interesting thing with this is, as well as recording the scores that learners obtained in the activities, we actually recorded the, the number of coins that people ended up with as well. Now, Santander are using that as quite an interesting comparison between um, knowledge obtained, but also confidence as well. Um, and actually taking that back to the learner audience to kind of evaluate confidence with data as well as the, the impact of the course. Um, this is then one of the activities. So the activities themselves were written in storyline. So all we do, we jump across from the, the game engine component to what are quite traditional learning activities within Articulate Storyline. And it integrates really well. So it's a high-end solution, but I think the bit I really like here, and the, I guess the bit I'd like to emphasize is this idea of gambling, this idea that you know, I'm being given choice here at, at which point to do something. It adds to the anxiety, um, and the gambling mechanism is actually quite a nice mechanism that people probably are familiar with from other game playing experiences. So that's um, a number of examples. We can, there are links there on the screen that so you can hopefully have a play yourselves to kind of dig a little bit deeper. So to finish with, really, some takeaways. Now, it's really hard to think about things that you can actually go away and start using immediately to build some great games yourselves. But I think there are some basic um, things that we've learned, which I'd like to kind of put across to you. The first of which is um, this one. Um, does anyone remember this game? I certainly do. In the playground at school, um, used to really worry about what was hidden underneath those bits of paper. Um, fortune teller indeed. Um, paper prototype. I, would, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of actually playing games on paper before you open your authoring tool. The problem is if you, and we've done it ourselves, if you open your authoring tool and start coding, it's very difficult to backtrack because you get very precious about what you've done. Play it on paper 
Um, we did some of the early games that you've just seen on paper. Immediately, we found people were getting confused. We were finding that everyone was ending up with the same score. Not a good thing in a game. So we introduced gambling. We introduced a timer. We, made, we, we just started to mix things up a bit. It's great for getting the engagement from stakeholders, buy-in from learners, etc. cetera. Um, do it on paper, it's fun. Um, and it really helps you refine um, your idea before you um, get into the technology. The next one, probably the most important, it's really tempting to create Call of Duty and incredible, this incredible experience that people are totally engaged with. The, the worry is the rules. Um, keep things very, very simple. I can't emphasize that enough. People get confused so easily. Um, if they get confused within 10 seconds, you've lost them. You know, three rules, I would say. You have 10 minutes to achieve these three things and you've got 100 coins to spend. That's it. Don't add too much complexity, otherwise you will put them off. If people don't want to read rules. Um, keep it really, really simple. Now, the final one, um, I'm going to take my life in my hands here and do something live. So this is a time for you to interact again. Now, the final one for me is something that's really missing from, from game design, even that we've done and from what I've seen in the industry is games are social. You know, games involve competition, they involve collaboration. Now, how can we do that? It's, it's really hard. Um, we need to think about ways to create leaderboards to allow people to see how other people are doing. The problem with creating leaderboards is often we need to dig into the learning management system to accumulate scores to then present that back to the learner. We don't actually have to do that. Um, there are easy, easy ways to create leaderboards. I have found a one example here. Now, there is a demo link there, which hopefully um, Joan can share with you on the, on the chat, but I'd like you to actually run this storyline course. There is a free leaderboard here called Dreamlo. Now, I've created a very simple storyline course with this embedded in the course. It allows you to um, create a score in that course and then see a leaderboard of everyone who has taken that. Um, so if you go to the link at the top there, um, it's a short link, so hopefully it's a little bit easier to type in. Um, there is a link to the site itself, but also I've provided a link to the storyline source files as well, if you are interested. To make things easy for you, I'll do it myself. So I'll select the link. It takes me to the storyline module. You'll have to excuse my storyline development skills. We've got two things to ask here. So it's going to ask me my name. So today maybe I'm going to be Tim. Submit that. On the next screen, it's going to ask me how many games I've played this year. Well, actually, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I've played eight games this year. Submit that. And there I am on the leaderboard. You can see that Richard Hyde, myself, has played the game previously and scored eight. Now, if you have managed to go to the link, I can't see anyone who has. This is a live leaderboard. Um, my limited coding skills mean it actually just flash in this course, but it's a basic um, mechanism which I've set up, but it is pooling everyone's scores in real time. It is free. It is very easy to do. It doesn't need to touch the learning management system. And there are many, many ways that we can do this. Please, someone go to the leaderboard and post the results. <laughs> Obviously not managing to do it. But anyway, and we'll leave that on the screen for a second just to see if anything happens. But if I took that again, it would add another score. Have a go with that. It's, it's, a, great, it's a great thing to try. And I think that's pretty much me. Um, that's my Twitter handle. You know, we do publish you know, ideas and things on Twitter. We all love followers, so please follow us if, if you can. Um, and we'll hopefully share knowledge going forward. I hope that's been really useful for you. Um, I think we've got just under 10 minutes left if anyone's got any questions. But we are going to send out a link to the recording of this webinar. There is a link to the slides there. Um, we can probably post that in the chat as well. Um, watch out for the next webinar coming up. And also, if you're not a member of the ELN yet, 
please join up. Um, it's £29 to join, which then gives you option to loads of stuff, the most significant of which probably is the next event, which is in May, um, and it's on VR and AR. Really interesting event, some great speakers doing live demos of technology. So if you're interested in trends beyond gamification, really worth attending. We have got some time for questions though. Um, if, if Joan, if you want to pick anything up that people have asked over the session, um, I'll try my best and answer questions. Yeah, thanks Richard. Um, uh, first of all, apologies because uh, as panelists, Richard, you and I can see all the chat, but it turns out that um, participants are actually only chatting to us and can't see everybody else's. I've just gone into Zoom and I can't see a way of undoing that. But what I am going to do is pay the chat uh, and then I can share it with everybody by email. Um, there was one question earlier on. When you showed the uh, degree to which people were multitasking or engaged in the different options like music, you had a globe there and Steph wanted to know what that globe re re represented. Oh, sorry, yes, I skipped that one probably. That was browsing the internet. Ah, the internet, okay, that makes sense. Which I guess isn't quite, people still do multitask, but I think it, it was not as much as music. I mean, a lot of that slide was, when, when, we, when you look through it, it was common sense, but I think when you put game, gameplay on the bottom there, it really <coughs> just highlights how immersive games are. Um, and for me, that kind of, it opened my eyes to, we're really onto something here if we do it right. Um, I think that's, again, the message coming through is, you know, this kind of applying it properly to the work to workplace learning. Thank you. And then we've got two more questions at the moment that I can see. One is about data protection issues uh, in gaming, and I guess that that's from Pat. And it's maybe to do with leaderboards and things. And John's asked a question about accessibility. Can games be accessible, or do we just offer an alternative? I think, yeah, data protection is an issue, um, particularly, I mean, some of the work that we've done, in, we actually use a, a system called Firebase, which takes, the leaderboard I showed you was a free tool, and I wouldn't recommend using it for like a commercial delivery. Um, it, it's not particularly stable or feature rich. But there is a Google uh, initiative called Firebase, um, which again is, you know, is a fantastic product, and it allows you to store any metrics about the learner on this external site. Um, it is fully encrypted. I mean, it's a Google service, so it is extremely robust. Um, I mean, I guess it depends really what you're storing. Um, I mean, if you're storing things like mm, name and score, then maybe there are less of issues than if you're accumulating a list of people who've failed. Um, it can all be done through the LMS. So, you know, then it's just data which is being pulled from the LMS anyway. And you've got that decision to make it exactly what you do show back to the learner population. Do you show maybe where they sit within, you know, as a percentage within the, the population that they are competing against? Or do you show individual scores? You've got that ability to kind of, I guess, drill down as, as far as you really want to go. Um, and the next question, I mean, accessibility is a challenge, I think. Um, I think certainly some of the ones that you've seen from us, they're not accessible. You know, I'm, I'm the first to admit that. Um, so I would say things need to be simplified. I mean, maybe some of the um, some of the website examples I showed you, like the spent example. I mean, that's it's web development, so that could well be accessible. Um, but there will be some challenges, I think, because of some of the statuses that are available around the screen. Um, you know, we're going to have to tab around really to kind of make those accessible. Yeah to um to people who need them but yeah what was, there are challenges. what was the link you mentioned at the beginning so the link to the, the website yeah um spent is it the website the, the example of a progressive display or multi-session example i gave yes when you talked about um accessibility initially i think you mentioned a, a, a tool that you used but you didn't actually type it in so oh sorry no i can't remember what that was <laughs> Uh, and Kay says, do you feel that gamification is applicable to all demographics? As an organisation, they have a broad workforce and the younger audience might feel bored as they are spoilt with game content available to them day to day. How can you counter this? That's a really interesting question, isn't it? Um, yes, because effectively, yeah, you're dealing with people who maybe who haven't experienced games 
and those who've experienced to the point of irritation. How do you actually pitch something with game mechanics working that is appropriate to that audience? I, I really think that there are opportunities there. I mean, and I go back to the mechanics that I mentioned, you know, I go back to this, um, the anxiety, you know, I think it's about creating a, a real experience for people. It's about storytelling. I mean, there's, there's a lot more to game design than just avatars and badges and leaderboards, you know, there, um, storytelling, um, there's a curve of interest as well where, you know, things get really difficult in a game, but then they kind of ease off for a little while as well. We don't do this in learning um, enough. And I think, you know, there is, there is the concept of serious games as well, which are a lot more business focused. Um, I mean, we've been building games which allow people to, we're doing one called Skip the Dip, which is for managers to help new recruits skip that kind of period when they first join an organization where they're effectively in a bit of a void. They don't, they don't know really what their challenges are. They don't know what the opportunities are. So it allows managers like a deck of cards to kind of make a series of decisions in, in a, their own order to, to help an, an individual go through a, um, a kind of engagement process with the organization. And that's a, you know, that's a real opportunity to try something, which is my job. It's, it's that, again, it's that idea of, it's a safe place to try stuff um, um, that you know I can fail safely. And I really think that anyone who who wants to succeed in an organisation is going to be motivated by something that's going to help them do their job better. And and we have a question from Steph as to whether you have any statistics, sorry, statistics on response rates for gamified versions of e-learning modules versus non-gamified or any other comparative ROI type measures or figures? Well, we do actually, yes. Um, one of the games that we developed was based on the Santander game sort of engine that you saw, um, and it was for Boots. We actually submitted this for an award at the end of 2000, well, at the end of, it was, no, so it was delivered at the end of 2015. So it was for the Boots product campaign, and it was a non-mandatory piece of learning that Boots sent out to their entire estate. So these were, this was 80,000 learners. Now, it was non-mandatory, so it was like, here, here are the, the Boots Christmas products. Um, play this 10-minute game, um, and hopefully you, know, you can sell more of those products during the Christmas period. Some stores took the training, some didn't. In the stores that took the training, the uptake um, was significant to the point that the, um, the in-store ordering in those stores went up by 18% compared to stores who didn't, which I think was about 5%. In-store ordering is basically where a customer goes into a store, can't find what they're looking for, but a colleague can actually help them buy it from a console in-store. That went up by 18%. This non-mandatory game had a completion rate of 45,000 people out of an audience of 80,000, compared to the previous year, which was traditionally learning, of 15,000. Now, yes, the game was effective, but for us, the most significant thing is what Boots did. They wanted a leaderboard in the game. Rather than put a leaderboard on the LMS, they put an A1 sheet of paper in every store. People wrote their scores on that sheet of paper. Everyone then wanted to be on that sheet of paper, and that was a really clever way of linking the hard to the soft. Um, and they reckon that was one of the most significant effects um, or impacts of making the game so, so, so successful, you know, is, is a physical leaderboard. So yes, in that situation, you know, we have really great evidence that games in the right place at the right time uh, can be extremely effective. Interesting. And I suppose coming back to the earlier point, Boots staff would be all different ages. Absolutely. I mean, these were working mothers, um, young sales assistants, managers, um, a real variety. Um, I mean, the interesting one there is Boots actually created the e-learning for that module. We just configured the game engine. We delivered it in three weeks um, because of the window. You know, they have a lockdown in November and December when they cannot deliver any learning. So it had to be delivered in 15 minutes, you know, at, at the end of October. Um, but yeah, a, a very wide demographic with, you know, very good uptake. So I think hopefully that ticks that box and shows that you know, if it's fit for purpose, I think everyone will, will appreciate and learn from a well-designed game. 
Well, thank you very much, Richard. We've run out of time, uh, well, perfectly on time, actually. So uh, a great session, I'm sure everybody will agree. Uh, I'd like to draw it to a close now. Uh, if you're not a member of the e-learning network, uh, it would be great if you could join. There is a free option as well as the £29 option. And uh, if you've got time now and, and you're interested in further webinars, do let us know what you think would make a good topic, uh, because we will be doing a bit more research on that later. Uh, I'll, I'll leave the chat window open a little bit longer. Richard, if you could pass control back to me. Uh, and again, can I just say thank you very much and thank you to all the participants who joined the session today. We'll make the chat available and we'll make the slides and the recording of the session available. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for your contributions.